Action. All right, action time, Xavier. Thank you very much for joining us today and giving us a talk about your your this really cool resin you have created for us. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, Erin, for inviting me today. Uh, what I'd like to introduce to you today is the work we've been uh, doing in the past, let's say, seven to uh, uh, three to four years. We started in 2017, this work. Um, and the initial idea was that we recognized that there was a need in the field for uh, something that would be conductive. Uh, and this was at the time. Uh, so a lot of this uh, project is uh, relying on his push in this direction. Um, so what I'd like to present to you is more or less how we got to create the R221 and what we where we are at at the moment, but it's not a completely finished project. And those of you that are using the resin already know that uh, there are a few things that are still missing uh, or still under development. So I'll go straight to the point. Uh, I won't detail why we do CLEM, because if you are here today, it means that you are aware of what is CLEM. Um, I will not explain what type of CLEM uh, is available, because again, uh, if you're here, it means that you're already an expert and you feel confident in the idea. What I will focus is the in-resin fluorescence and volume correlative microscopy, uh, which is uh, the, really the point of this resin. Uh, but there are hundreds of ways of doing correlative microscopy, and this is not the purpose of this presentation. Uh, so basically, there are many workflows, uh, dynamic CLEM, I will not go into the details, uh, but in the in-resin fluorescence volume correlative microscopy, uh, there are a few steps which are quite critical and I'll try to present them before uh, presenting the results, because I think this is the background uh, required for the, for, the, for the understanding of how we design this resin. So there's the fixation first step, uh, which is essential, and it's... Um, it's actually, in our case, we use vitrification. Uh, I'll go back into that question uh, just afterwards. And then the embedding, uh, free substitution, which is also a critical step and both uh, steps are important. And obviously the applications we could find are uh, 2D clamp, that's one thing, uh, but also 3D volume clamp, uh, which is uh, quite important. And I will focus mostly on this uh, 2D, uh, uh, on this volume uh, correlative microscopy. So in correlative microscopy, there are a few bottlenecks and um, I'm sure you're all were, uh, well aware of them, but um, the critical steps are uh, in multimodal sample preparation. Uh, if we want to do correlative light and electron microscopy, the purpose of the resin today, um, we need to have something which will be compatible both with light microscopy and electron microscopy. And if we do dynamic clamp, so we look at something alive and then fix it, somewhat um, we separate those two steps of light and electron microscopy by the fixation step. Um, but if we want to do in resin fluorescence microscopy, uh, then the protocol must be compatible both with the light microscopy and the electron microscopy. And this is where it becomes a major challenge. Uh, and so, of course, this is related to the, the imaging techniques as well. Uh, whether you want to do light microscopy, electron microscopy, um, uh, atomic force microscopy will influence the way you prepare your sample. And so a few years ago now, uh, there was a paper that presented in a very uh, attractive way a preservation of the fluorescence after high pressure freezing and embedding in love acryl. Um, this paper gave rise to the in-resin fluorescence correlative microscopies. And we've seen a lot of these applications now, and I think this is a very beautiful technique. Um, but then kind of a bit before, but it was still under, under the radar uh, for many, uh, was also the development of volume electron microscopy by serial block phase imaging, uh, which is a bit different from electron tomography and serial section in tomography. And so the interest of the project that I'm going to present today was to be able to combine those two techniques uh, as efficiently as possible. And so before going into that, uh, I'd like to redefine exactly what we're looking for. Uh, what is vitrification? What causes the like, crystallization and then therefore dehydration? 
Um, this is a very naive presentation of the work, but uh, I think uh, this is quite self-explaining. I'll try to have the laser pointer. Uh, pointer, laser pointer, yeah. Yes. So basically, uh, we have here uh, an illustration of what could be done with vitrification by high pressure freezing and serial and um, uh, and uh, vitreous sectioning. Uh, this work was done uh, by me a few years ago during my PhD at the beginning of my PhD. And the way we understand vitreous water is basically the water is immobilized in a structure which is similar to when it's liquid. So basically, it's not crystallizing. And when the water starts to crystallize, uh, one of the big question is basically the ice crystals starts to grow and pushes away the material which is inside. The second point is the crystal tends to like being uh, as pure as possible. So it will extract the water from the molecules surrounding it so that it can grow. And why it does that, it dehydrates progressively the uh, the proteins which are around, which give us this kind of gradient of quality of images, where we have here the semovis considered as being the, the best imaging we could do. Um, and then we have a very, I would call it perfect plastic ultrastructure. So basically the structure looks very close to what we're expecting from uh, the semovis and things are looking smooth and round and the, the, the gradient is rather homogeneous. So basically we have a homogeneous staining. Um, and then we start to see the ice damages, basically where the segregation starts to become stronger. And then we have ice nucleation, which are excluding the, the, the proteins. And therefore you have a very dense protein around a uh, white core. And then you start to have more crispy aspect of the images. And that's the beginning of bad crystallization, bad vitrification. And then of course, this is the obvious case when you have a very disastrous freezing and then you have ice bombs everywhere and you have ice crystals and dry matter all around. This looks disastrous. And unfortunately, we've all seen that once if we've done some high pressure freezing or vitrification. Um, another naive way to present that is basically we have a phase segregation. So this was, this is obviously not the same case, but that's quite illustrative. Uh, when you have um, orange juice that segregates in your fridge and then suddenly you start to have like the phase which is segregated from the liquid. That's just an illustration. Of course, this is not the me same mechanism be beneath. And this is the, the same drawings illustrating the same thing. Basically, you extract at each step of crystallization, you extract some water molecules to grow your ice crystals all around, and you have your dry matter inside. This is a naive presentation, but I think this makes the point. And so a second part of this is this fluorescence, call, uh, this, uh, this um, vitrification and crystallization causes some dehydration of the material. And so a, a view of it is the fluorescence in the sample when you vitrify it will depend on the state of crystallization you have. Um, to some extent, and I have no clue, this is a, a, a abstract, uh, abstract uh, view of it, but I expect that to some extent, a minor crystallization or very tiny crystals of ice uh, will not necessarily affect the, the, the fluorescence in your sample. And then the more the crystals grow, the more it affects the structure of the GFP. Let's take this as an example. And so then suddenly you'll start to have a decrease in the fluorescence while the ice damages and uh, ice nucleation grows. Um, in the middle, we have some kind of auto fluorescence. Maybe this is actually not true. And basically it's following exactly the same line as the massive ice damage uh, curve I'm presenting here. I don't know about that, but I know that at some point when we vitrify the material, we start to have autofluorescence emanating from the ice crystals. What causes that? How does it work? I have no clue, but this is something we observe in cryo stages. Um, and so this approach uh, gave rise to uh, very attractive technologies of cryo-like microscopy, and I will not go into that details, but I wanted to put that into, into context because this is important in the fluorescence preservation that we will uh, look into afterwards. And so there were a lot of very beautiful papers about that. Here are the references. Uh, I don't think I have all of them in the, in the Dropbox, but you can find them fairly easily. Now I'll try to go into the free substitution steps. So basically half, after high pressure freezing your sample or vitrifying it by plunging, uh, what we are going to do is to extract the water, the solvent, uh, so the water solvent, 
uh, and replace it by another solvent um, like acetone, alcohol, um, and then replace this acetone and replace it by a resin. Uh, we use this acetone or ethanol step because the resin itself will not uh, remove the water on its own, or at least not the ones we're using in our labs. And so what is interesting is that the, the polarity of the solvent uh, will influence the type of um, free substitution and the contrast we will gain. Uh, there was a very beautiful paper about that uh, that came out uh, in 2007 uh, that showed that preserving some, for instance, some water in the, in the free sub cocktail will preserve the contrast. And one way to understand that is that basically the full dehydration of your proteins might collapse the fluorescence and might pre, uh, make the, the, the proteins dehydrating so much that then the stain have hard time to go into the proteins to contrast them. That's an interpretation. Again, uh, I'm not a pure chemist, so I have, this is, a, this is a visualization of the idea. But then basically, if you keep some water, you will keep somehow the structure, uh, the, the very core structure of the proteins, including the fluorescent proteins, and uh, then you can replace it by a resin and you will embed your whole sample. And so basically you don't dehydrate it too much. So basically the, the, the resin and the stain can start to penetrate the protein, the, the protein and give some color in your, uh, for, in your free substitution. And so then we go into, uh, we go from the water molecules, which is rather thin uh, to a solvent. Here is the acetone and here is the ethanol. We see that the structure is quite different. The acetone in the end has three carbons, so it's a bit bigger than the ethanol, but then it has the uh, same type of polarity as water has. So it's very polar uh, molecule compared to uh, ethanol, which is slightly less polar. And then we replace that by uh, HM20. Uh, and this is one of the, of the key questions we have here. Uh, and basically we try to embed the sample into a resin. So, that's, that's the concept I just mentioned. Basically, we have the water molecule supporting the proteins, and then you dehydrate it using acetone, but not fully. So basically, the very uh, small part of the molecules will, be remain, will remain maintained by the water. Uh, and you add, while you add this acetone, you come in it with some uranium acetate or some contrasting agent, heavy metal salt, uh, together with fixatives. UA is a kind of a fixative, but you can also add glutaraldehyde or osmiums and other molecules. And again, there are many ways of doing the fixation. And then you replace this acetone by the resin. And basically, hopefully, you'll have deposited some stain in the, uh, in the, in the different areas of the molecules of the proteins you're interested in. And therefore, you will start to gain some contrast. You increase the density here locally so that the electrons will not uh, go through too easily. And then you will gain some contrast in your TEA. It's not only the, 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 the heavy metal soap that gave some contrast, the protein themselves also have a density and they will slow down some of the, of the electrons. So basically, depending on your electron uh, setup, uh, electron microscope setup, you will have some contrast even without contrasting agent, but it will be very mild. And so based on this, uh, on this uh, HM20 uh, work, uh, there has been uh, three papers uh, that uh, I believe uh, are setting up the path to us on how we do in resin fluorescence microscopy. Um, the first one was by Susan Nixon, then we had Vanda Kukulski who made a marvelous work on even combining this fluorescence on section with very high precision localization. And she pushed that to temporal resolution with the yeast work she did. And then uh, Chris explored also all the applications of this uh, preservation and combining it with uh, quick free substitution as well, uh, and showed that we can have an optimal preservation of the fluorescence at some stage. And so the problem is that when we do this free substitution, we come up with fixatives and with some stain. And these guys, they come and they just fix the proteins together and somehow they prevent the molecules to resonate. And that's one of the key points is the GFP has to be able to vibrate, to be able to fluoresce. And so if you put too much fixatives, or if you put a resin that tends to attach to the groups, like amine groups in the, in the epoxy resin of the molecules, then you will start to prevent this vibration. And then the molecule, the GFP, will not vibrate anymore. And so there is some kind of an optimal uh, situation where basically the adjunction of any fixatives or stain will start to decrease the fluorescence. 
But then this is what gains you also a significant contrast in TN. So we could see it as there is an optimum in to in resin fluorescence where we have a very low amount of UA and a, and, and a preserved fluorescence. But the problem is this balance is kind of not optimal for both. So basically, you will not have a very good fluorescence and you will not have a very good contrast. And this is especially problematic for volume electron microscopy, where currently one of the major view of it is that we need to have a very high amount of uh, contrasting agent to evacuate the charges in uh, scanning electron microscopy approaches. Um, so that's one thing. And the second thing is also the size of the molecules we're using. Uh, osmium or uh, uranilastate are very large molecules. And so they also tend to uh, be quite um, bulky into the protein so that they quickly prevent any vibrations and things like that. In, 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 uh, in addition to, the, to the, the chemical reaction they do when they attach the molecules. So what we wanted to do was to be able to reduce as much as we could the stain and fixatives and to preserve the fluorescence and have some as much as possible uh, fluorescence to do in resin fluorescence and then of course we wanted to evacuate the charges and so the first idea as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk came from Roger Vep, who said like look um, I've tested this resin that came up in, in uh, 1986 uh, that was marvelous gave amazing results very high contrast and I didn't have to put any heavy metal salt in the free substitution cocktail could you do it again uh, he asked me that because uh, at Cryocapsel, we're quite familiar with polymers. Uh, this is one of the specialty of the company. And that, back then we were working in a polymer lab. So basically our company was hosted in a polymer uh, lab. And uh, so basically that was the main question. Could you reproduce this resin? So that was the first idea. Uh, but then when you read the paper and when you discuss with him and uh, other uh, chemists around, it's basically the, the, the production of this resin is quite problematic, it could be explosive, and uh, it's not very uh, stable a long time. So while well, putting an explosive compound in, in the lab is not always the easiest uh, material, and this is something that as a company you don't want to do, uh, because you sell it to a guy who does not do the right thing, and then suddenly you have a problem because, well, whatever happens. So as a company, you don't want to sell TNT to anyone, uh, or you are no longer a biotech company. So what we decided was to go and start from a blank page, um, not trying to take what was existing, uh, but trying to rethink the whole process from the very beginning. And for that, we worked with a chemist, a polymer chemist. And so the prerequisite we had were to have something that after embedding would become electroconductive. How does it work? How would it work? We had no clue. And that actually that was the, the aim, but we had no ideas of the path. Obviously, we wanted to have a very high contrast, and we could afford having some traces of contrasting agent, but that was not the, 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 the only idea. If we need to have heavy metal salt, we use it, but that's an option. Um, it should allow some water during free substitution, so it should have some hydrophilicity to some extent, because the papers before demonstrated that it increases the contrast, and basically the idea of the protein collapse and everything remained valid for this study. Uh, obviously, it should preserve the fluorescence pro uh, properties. That was the idea. Uh, and so we wanted to avoid the cross-linking. So any resin reacting like the epoxy was kind of out of the scope because epoxy resin uh, react with the amine groups of the molecules, and therefore it blocks the fluorescence. This is why EPON is not uh, ideal for preserving fluorescence. It's not ideal. It does not mean it does not um, allow it. There are some papers around that or you would need to, um, to, to remove the epon after you do the sectioning, which is done. It has been published and everything. Uh, I've, never went, I've never gone into these uh, uh, protocols personally. The first idea was it should remain liquid at minus 30 degrees because we wanted to take inspiration from the Lovicryl that is uh, to us the, 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 the gold standard. And I've used it personally mostly. So uh, I like the Lovicryl for its ease of use. And so uh, having something liquid at minus 30 degrees was something interesting. It should polymerize under UV uh, because, uh, well, warming up the resin while you want to keep it at minus 30 degrees is kind of uh, counterproductive. And I wanted to have a resin that could be stored in a, in, a, in a chemical cabinet, not 
uh, polymerizing because it's stored at 20 degrees. So the UV is convenient because it prevents having a um, early uh, degradation of the of the resin. Um, Obviously, it should remain transparent to uh, visible light after polymerization, or at least the range of GFP, uh, RFP. Um, and it should allow uh, sectioning by microtomy or obviously ion milling after polymerization. Uh, and I'll come back to that microtomy step uh, later on in this presentation. So I know that some uh, lab uh, did some tests to load existing resin with uh, conductive agent. So here I show you some uh, carbon nanotubes or some carbon black or some uh, uh, silver flakes and things like that. That was a, one of the idea. And one of the first thing we realized is that even if you take carbon so-called nanotube, indeed they're nano, but if you look at this image and if you look at the scale bar here, you would realize that this carbon nanotube will never ever go through the plasma membrane of a cell simply because that's way too big. And so it cannot diffuse inside the cell. And since it cannot diffuse inside the cell, what would be the best case scenario would be that these carbon nanotubes will drain the electrons outside of the cell, but not inside where we have the material of interest. So we did not go into this carbon nanotube approach uh, to start with. Carbon black is an option. Uh, we've heard that some lab did some trials with this and they were not so happy with the results or at least uh, we have not seen the results. I mean, I have not seen the results myself so I, I cannot evaluate how much it was uh, efficient. So basically the idea is the following and the, the, the electrons will be gliding over the carbon nanotubes but since the carbon nanotube cannot enter through the plasma membrane, well, basically, the electrons that will be inside will remain uh, uh, sticking and they will somehow charge. And that's what we see in the scanning electron microscopy uh, process. So basically, the idea would be that your cell would remain charged inside while it will discharge outside. That's an option, but that's not sufficient to what we were looking for. And so what we decided was to try to start from the idea of the lobic grill and try to create a resin that would uh, eventually uh, be charged with um, ions like uh, silver ions or zinc ions, like it was proposed in this uh, tin uh, resin. So basically trying to charge the resin with uh, some silver or some uh, metals uh, inside the composition to try to become somehow um, conductive. And so this was one of the ideas. Uh, and we've done, then decided to test a large variety of resins. So basically with our uh, polymer chemist, we created a huge amount of resins. Uh, and I will not go into the details of that because this is part of the, of the, of the R&D. Um, but basically what we were doing is high pressure freezing batches of cells, free substituting them together in the same free sub in the same uh, machine, removing Andreas's I don't. Everything okay, Xavier? Yeah, no, I, I see Andres talking and the microphone is not off. Uh, but it, he may be just chatting okay, in the background. Okay. It's okay. I, I thought he was inter interacting. Please excuse me. <laughs> um, so, so the idea was to do this comparison uh, to be able to to evaluate the, um, the, the 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 behavior of the resin in comparison with HM20. So each time we were doing a free sub run, we had one batch of whatever resin it is and one batch of HM20 and then sectioning it all and then looking at the different aspects. So what we were looking into was the contrast in the, the TEM. And I'm talking about the TEM because where I was doing this uh, research at the Institut Curie, we did not have an SEM. So since we had locally a very good TEM, I just used that. Uh, we wanted to have the general intensity of the images uh, because that's uh, an indication of whether you have a uh, good contrast or not a good uh, evacuation of charges. Um, how do we do the focus and astigmatism in SCM and TM is not that much relevant, but for SCM and that's, you will see later on that this is one way of evaluating. Uh, we wanted to evaluate the embedding quality. Uh, this is quite important because if you have a conductive resin but the embedding is bad, well, you can't do anything. Uh, sectioning properties, because uh, as I was saying, I did that on the microtome, so I did a lot of sectioning. 
and you will see that the sectioning is definitely not the best thing in this regime. And obviously, then going to a volume SEM microscope and doing the charge an, uh, analysis, and uh, last but not least, the fluorescence preservation. So each time we have a new batch of resin, we've tried to test all of these parameters at once. Uh, so basically, that was happening like that. I was putting the, the, the sample two by two into this rosette from the AFS2, you will recognize. And so then I was doing the sectioning. And so that was the first one, that was the second one a fourth one and whatever, and I've done a lot of them. And then you can already see that with the same free sub cocktail, the general aspect is quite different. I was trying to have same type of sections, same thickness, trying to fix to, to 70 nanometer, and uh, same parameters on the TEM. None of these sections were post-stained. So basically, I was just taking the sections, going to the electron microscope to remove as many steps as possible so that that would be somewhat comparable. And so I did that over a large amount of samples. And then one of them, uh, and all the samples were high pressure frozen uh, locally. So that basically that's something also that we could always uh, make sure that we had the same parameters. And so the cocktails we've tested also a few cocktails uh, varying from 0.05% to 0.1% of your annual estate. I always fix myself to keep only your annual estate, eventually glutaraldehyde, and one to five percent of water. I did not try to put other heavy metal salt because I wanted to narrow down the variability as much as I could. Uh, and you will already understand that this is hard to, to keep as precise as possible. Um, I noticed that the glutaraldehyde somehow increases the contrast uh, to some extent. I don't know exactly why. I have the feeling that the glutaraldehyde tends to squish a bit the membrane. So basically they become denser and that what gives me some contrast. Um, I'm not sure if this is just an interpretation or if this is reality. Uh, I'm not a chemist again, but somehow glutaraldehyde increases the contrast at the membrane. Then the, the temperature path was always set to be the same because uh, again, we want to remove the variability and we'll come back to that point uh, later on today. And uh, the first thing that we did not want to test was to put osmium tetroxide. I know that many people like to use that because it also increases a lot the contrast in the membrane. It's important in SEM. Uh, but the same as for the lovicryl, uh, the resin polymerizes with the UV. So we, do, we did not recommend uh, using osmium tetroxide in this, in this resin, uh, although we cannot prevent someone from doing it. And we'll come back to that point later on. Then the temperature curves, uh, you will be familiar with that. This resembles a lot the Nixon and the Kukuski protocols. So basically starting minus 80, going up to minus 40 degrees or right, five degrees uh, temperature uh, per hour. And then all of these steps, uh, I think since you will have the video, you can always come back to this uh, protocol in details. And so we've done that over and over and over again. And one day I was at the TM and then suddenly I had this kind of image under my eyes. And I was like, okay, I'll have the same imaging parameters as in the HN20 that I imaged a few minutes ago. And the contrast is significantly higher. The image is also a bit darker. Uh, so I was kind of, okay, is it because I did not focus the, the beam where I had some changes and so on? And Looking at it carefully, it seemed that the contrast model was much high, higher. And when we looked at the histogram, basically it's more spread. So basically we have a wider range of uh, contrast for the same number of counts. And so that was the first time that we had an idea that somehow the resin was more contrasting with the same conditions. Um, that was to me the interpretation that somehow the electrons did not go through the section and therefore they were dragged away. And I interpreted that as being uh, somewhat conductive. Uh, this is obviously an interpretation, uh, but that's you, you work with what you have as a, as a tool. And one day a student from Pasteur came to me and said like, look, Xavier, I'm look, I know that you're working on this electroconductive resin. Uh, we have a big trouble in our lab. Our project is not working. I'm struggling with imaging my samples. Could you give us some of your resin? And I said, look, for the moment, I don't have enough resin because there was only batches of 10 mLs each time I was working with it. So I had to be careful with the amount that I had. But I have this block. I don't know. It's good in TEM. Do you want to give it a look? So I gave it to him. 
uh, being in Pasteur, in Curie, uh, Pasteur is just next door. And uh, he called me back and said, like, look, we have a very great contrast. Uh, the images look really Im impressive compared to what we have uh, usually in, uh, in, uh, in our protocol. And so this is the images that you see here, where basically this is exactly what they sent to me and said, look, it's really good to us. I had no expertise in SEM. So myself, I could only trust them when they told me it's good. Because we had that, and because we already had a collaboration uh, very active with uh, Lucy Collinson's group and Chris Petty, I said, okay, I'll take these blocks and I will send them for more extensive work uh, with Chris Petty and Lucy Collinson, and they will look into it and they will uh, give me their feedback with a more quantitative aspect and not only we've tested it and it gives a good result. So I sent them uh, four of the best uh, candidates we had uh, and they imaged them uh, in, in parallel, and they just gave me um, um, how they felt about it. They, they, they did some quantification, they, they were imaging in a very strict way, but then they just gave me their feedback like, well, this one is nice to do, this one sections well, this one sections not so well, uh, the contrast is good, we have hard time to find the focus, we have hard time to uh, set the astigmatism. So very intuitive way of working. It was definitely not something um, I would say uh, mathematic uh, driven or physics driven. It was a uh, feeling from a biologist doing some work. Uh, and they did the test for each of these resin, both with the FIPSAM uh, on the CCOM and on the three view uh, Zeiss uh, Sigma. So basically each block was tested these three times and I already had the TEM images before. And they identified that one of the blocks was behaving better, and then they figured uh, by uh, successive uh, steps what were the best imaging parameters. And this is where we started to have like something like a hint. We had a product we could start to try to diffuse. Uh, before going in that part, so then that's when we decided to, to say, okay, we have a product, we need to upscale it because having it in my, in my lab is one thing, but as a company, we need to be able to diffuse it. And so with our chemist, we decided to, to make a big batch. And then we had to fine tune that because actually the big batches that we could order from the big company uh, to make and synthesize the, the polymer were not of the same quality as the one we used for the testing. And so basically we had to do this exact same procedure again. And this is something we did uh, together with uh, Jean-Marc Verbavatz and René Le Borgne at uh, Institut Jacques Monod. Uh, basically because we were about to launch the product and then we realized that what we were about to sell was not what we were testing in the lab. So that was a quite a stressful period, but uh, we managed to produce on a large scale the exact same product as what we had. And uh, this is when we start to do the next step is basically trying to combine fluorescence pres preservation and volume and imaging at the same uh, step. Um, also, of course, at that time, the focal charge compensation uh, was uh, becoming available and uh, Lucy Collinson uh, had it in, uh, in her lab. So basically we tested it and Chris uh, identified quite logically that actually it's a good combination. It adds up properties and one is not, I mean, one is uh, improving the other. Uh, obviously those of you that have the charge, focal, focal charge compensation uh, enjoy it already a lot. Uh, but it's a cumulative aspect with the resin. And so this is the kind of images we could obtain uh, from the volume electron microscope. Uh, and this one, so you have all the parameters on the, on the presentation here. Uh, and again, you will be able to look at them again. These parameters are always given with the user note uh, we send when you are using the resin. Uh, but obviously this is subject to evolution and uh, this is not, uh, an absolute uh, estimation. Your microscope might behave differently. Uh, that's quite uh, quite important to keep in mind. So, uh, I'm not sure if the video will move smoothly, uh, but I already presented that a few years ago in a in a meeting, and I know that uh, some of the of the participant asked me why we had some shadowing and some uh, variation in the, in the, in the thickness. Um, obviously this is not 
the perfect set. This is not the perfect resin that does everything at once perfectly, but it's already giving a significant improvement. And this is what we were uh, happy about. And then if we zoom into this particular region, we see that we have already in, uh, in the three view conditions, a very high contrast. We can see that uh, we see the cristae on the, on the, in the mitochondria. We can see the nuclear pore complexes uh, along the, the nuclear membrane. Uh, we can even see some buds near the endosomes. So basically, the, 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 the resolution we can obtain was already uh, very satisfying. And uh, this was very exciting to us. The same sample, or the same uh, block, was also put into the FIPSEM microscope. Um, and again, we had some very high contrast. So I know that the FIPSEM uh, is giving much higher contrast natively. Uh, and this is confirmed here. There is nothing uh, novel in this, uh, in this case. But this gives uh, to us a very good <laughs> results. I, I hope the video plays well. Uh, it jumps a bit, but I think it works nicely, Xavier. We definitely get the feeling. It, for a Zoom good. video, it's no worries. Don't, don't worry. Thanks. And so as you can see in FIPSEM, we could acquire the entire volume. Uh, the jumping is coming from the presentation. Uh, obviously, this in, in this case is not coming from the imaging uh, or from the data set. Um, and as you can see, we can go through an entire cell with a very high contrast uh, and no obvious charging appearing uh, during the imaging. Uh, so this is actually the same video. Uh, and this is on the right, on the on bottom right. Uh, uh, this is the, the volume uh, rendering of the, of the cell. Now, if we look at it in a, in a closer way, that's really jumping. I'm sorry for that. Uh, I don't know where it's coming from, but it's definitely from the projection. Uh, we can see that we can find some very uh, detailed structures. Here we have the mTOC, which is uh, nicely resolved next to the Golgi. We see that the endosomes are nicely presented, and we can see even the coat at the, mem at the membrane of the endosomes. Uh, also here, we see that very well. So we can obtain a very fine resolution, although we have only 0.05% of uranylestate in the cocktail and 0.1% or 0.01% of glutaraldehyde. So basically, although we have what we consider as being very close to no contrasting agent, we already have a very high contrast in the, in the structures. And that was surprising to us. Uh, and the first discussion we had with Lucy after she did the imaging, Lucy and Chris, and I was, uh, she was asking me uh, how much UA I placed into the, into the cocktail. And when I said it was 0.05, at first she did not believe me. And then the discussion was like, uh, she thought she misheard me. And then, uh, then obviously this is the results we obtained. So we were very enthusiastic. And, um, and this is the same image uh, without jumping. So as you can see, uh, we see the nuclear pore complexes. We see the coat under the uh, endocytic vesicles, uh, the coat at the, at the endosomes, uh, the Golgi and the COP1 uh, coating. So all of this is very uh, sharp. And this was to us uh, encouraging. Now, as I mentioned, when we put the uranium estate, whatever volume we put, this is a trade-off with the fluorescence. And already at 0.05% of uranium estate, we get some decrease in the fluorescence. Uh, that's something we noticed. But what is very interesting here is that in that case, I did the free substitution without any fixatives at all. And then here, this is the image of the sample after uh, sectioning in TM. And as you can see, the contrast is inexistent. We see barely anything. Um, and then this is with post-staining. So the post-staining brings up a bit of contrast, but in no way it's comparable to what we got in the free sub cocktail having 0.05% of urine elastate. So I don't know how this works, uh, I have no clue, but one thing is sure is that having the, the UA directly into the cocktail during the free sub have much better impact than the post-staining. And having no uh, contrasting agent in the resin makes it completely into, I mean, it makes no contrast 
and somehow it's charging the same way under the electron beam in SEM. So what we have to keep in mind is that the resin itself is not conductive, but in combination with a heavy metal salt, it starts to have conductive behavior. And one of the interpretations we have is that the resin behaves like a semiconductor. Semiconductors are um, uh, molecules that are insulators. And as soon as you change the lattice and as soon as you change their native state, they become conductive. That's the behavior of a semiconductor. And that's really what it, it's reminiscent of uh, looking at this uh, behavior of the resin. Now, one key thing was about the, the, the fine quality we could get. Uh, how does it preserve the ultra structure? How does it behave in a microtome? Um, so this is a, a wide uh, example. This one are um, melanocytic cell lines, so MNT1 cells. Sorry. Uh, and this, this is the result here. here. So there are very dark patterns, but we see that we have a very homogeneous contrast and it's nicely contrasted. Here, this is a C. elegans worm that was also uh, contrasted. All of this is the cocktail we used. And these are yeast. And we can see that we have already high contrast. And we can see very sharply the membranes uh, and even the bilayers of the membranes uh, quite uh, clearly. And this is visible in all types of samples. So the ultra structure preservation looked good to me. Uh, but obviously, the sectioning was a big deal. Um, and so what, of, what we noticed is that the embedding is not ideal. Uh, we have, if you have uh, some, some fragility regions, the sections will break up. Uh, and this makes a lot of holes. So basically, the resin is not ideal for uh, TEM and microtomy sectioning. Uh, this is redesigned for volume electron microscopy, uh, where the block actually remains solid and then you shave it uh, on the surface. What we also noticed is that uh, sometimes, uh, and it happened to, to us once, uh, basically it just chop off an entire piece inside the block. And so that's what happened once with the, with the nucleus where we had the entire nucleus chopped off from the block. Uh, so the, the embedding properties of the resin is not as great as uh, HN20, for example, or as EPON. But it gives us some good results uh, for the applications we're looking into. Xavier, so, can I ask a, a question? Yes, please. Sorry, sorry to jump in. Um, did you ever try uh, an oscillating knife on, 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 the, uh, on this resin? So not, uh, not yet, because I don't have it. <laughs> and I, I, must, I should ask Helmut if he could uh, share with me for, for a, few, a few days. Uh, some, I some mean, we, ha we have one at the Crick that it's not ours, but we could probably um, make, make use of it. So um, that, I mean, obviously, the sealed block face, uh, the, the three of you has an oscillating knife. But um, to do it outside, then, then we might be able to do that. Yeah. That could be great, yeah. So, well, thank you, Matt, for this uh, suggestion. I, I did not try it again. I, um, I've done this work. That was uh, a side project for me. Uh, I was working mostly on the high pressure freezer uh, that you see behind me on the presentation. Uh, and I wanted to have this resin uh, extra. So I must say that that was not a 100% uh, full-time job. Uh, but this is very interesting, obviously. And so what we did is this kind of work. And as you can see here, this is uh, reminiscent of what you just saw before. When we have no contrasting agent, no glutaraldehyde, then in TEM, the contrast is close to no, not existing. But as soon as you put traces, and I'm talking about 0.01% of UA, so we even decrease the amount of UA, we start to have a high contrast even in CECOM or in TEM. So this is kind of coherent with the, the semiconductive behavior of the resin. Um, or what we interpret as being a semiconductor behavior. And then at some point when we increased the amount of UA, we went up to 0.1% uh, of UA. Uh, it's kind of reaching a plateau in terms of contrast and also in the behavior in the SEM. 0.1% uh, is not much better in the SEM than 0.05%. Again, this is very empirical observations and, uh, and I do not quantify that. Uh, I don't know how to quantify it to be completely honest, uh, but that would be uh, most likely interesting on the long term. And the glutaraldehyde, uh, to some extent, increases also the, the contrast. So this was to compare with the HM20. Again, this work was always done in a, in a parallel way uh, so that we could see the improvements uh, if there was some. 
And so if you put the two images next to one another, here in that case, uh, this is in absence of any contrasting agent. Uh, as you can see here, no blue trial behind, 5% of water. And in HM20 versus RT21, we see that we have a bit more, and this was done in a CCOM, we have a bit more uh, of uh, contrast and the images are slightly sharper. Um, kind of, it's easier to get some focus, to get a proper focus is easier. Um, and as soon as we put a bit of uh, urine in a state, uh, the contrast becomes significantly sharper. So that's another way of estimating the improvement of the resin over the HN20. Again, this is not quantitative. Uh, we are working into quantification of all of this. This is one of the work we're, uh, we've tried to do with, uh, with Chris, but the, the, the COVID came into play. So uh, we are starting back this work now. But as you can see, we already have some uh, incentives that it's getting, uh, we have a more, um, uh, a more contrasting resin and we call it conductive. Maybe this is uh, an, abusive, an abusive term, but that's uh, the behavior it gives. And so obviously all this, this work had to be integrated into one single experiment. And uh, these images are more for the, for the, for the pleasure. So basically what we did is high pressure freezing uh, CL against worms that were expressing both GFP and RFP, uh, embedding them into the, into the usual cocktail and then doing in-resin fluorescence microscopy. What we observed here is that using a confocal SP8 uh, from Leica, uh, we could get uh, very sharp images. And what is interesting is that in those uh, data set, the laser power was brought up to 40%. So for those of you that are familiar with uh, confocal microscopy, we rarely go above 5%, and 5% is really a maximum that people tend to use. Normally it's 0.04%, 0.4% of, of, the, of the laser power. Here we're at 40%. So it's significantly more, 100 times more. And uh, not only this, this it gave very nice results, but we did not observe any bleaching uh, and it did not alter the, 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 the structures underneath afterwards. So this block was imaged at the Curie Institute and then I sent it to Chris so that it could do the volume electron microscopy. And so that he could get familiar with the block, he went back to an epifluorescence microscope and he could image the same worm and look at it again. And he was not uh, looking for the fluorescence. It was not bleached and we, we were using, again, a huge amount of uh, laser power. So, and so then what he did was to acquire uh, three view data sets at these different locations and a FIPSEM at the head of the worm. And so, Basically, this is the data uh, we could obtain. Uh, here has been segmented out. This one is the volume and this is the FIPSEM. And so what we did afterwards was to combine these images together uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the computer. Uh, so for that, we use ECCLAM. Uh, for those of you that know me, uh, it's a software that we co-develop with Perrin. Uh, and though basically what we did was to uh, place these structures directly into the volume and then combine the images. So as you can see, the, the matching is quite good, and this is expected in a way, uh, simply because we're looking at the same volume, both in light microscopy and in electron microscopy. And so basically, since we're always looking at the block and not at the sections, we're looking at unaltered structures. So basically, the matching is, uh, is uh, ideal, uh, if not to say optimal. So this is a, a side effect, but this is a quite uh, interesting one. So that's the, the way we did it. Uh, that's the visualization. And this all of this combining uh, was done with ECCLAM. So I let you appreciate the, the, the final images. And again, this was done with the 0.05% of your elastic and water in the free sub cocktail. So uh, it's very mild amount of UA, uh, which is also one important point because UA is becoming challenging everywhere. And one of the steps we're about to start now is to test alternatives to UA to see whether we could use something else. 
three, four weeks ago, Andrea mentioned uh, ULS and UAR. Uh, we're also working, I mean, we're also looking into um, lanthanide salts and we'll try to see whether it has the same quality or not. And so the last thing, because it has been asked several times, and this is uh, one of the, of the points which I think is important, is how the protocol we've been recommending so far is subject to evolution and what could be improved or not. Uh, so what we've seen is that um, the free sub cocktail from 0.01% uh, starts to be functional uh, up to 0.1%. Uh, the glutaraldehyde, as I mentioned before, uh, gives some higher contrast. What is the mechanism behind? I don't know exactly, because it's definitely not a, fix, a, a contrasting agent. Uh, the importance of keeping water into, into the free sub cocktail is essential. Uh, and dry acetone is to be kind of uh, always strict that on the on the volume of, of water we have in. As I mentioned at the beginning, the osmium tetroxide is not recommended. However, last two weeks ago during the Zeiss meeting, I discussed with Paul Gakada, who told me that he used uh, osmium tetroxide in the R221 regime, and it polymerized well, and he was happy with it, and he's looking into the results right now. So this is one thing that is uh, about to, to be more uh, widely known. Um, also, uh, immunoglobin sections has been tried once, uh, not successfully, uh, which uh, was not the point of developing this regime. Uh, but why not tr trying it? For the moment, I don't have any, uh, anybody came back to me saying like, oh, I have a protocol that works. I only had one trial telling me why it didn't work. Again, that was not my main focus. Another point that was raised uh, by Paolo Ronchi uh, from the MBL during this choice meeting was the, the slope at which the uh, temperature should be raised uh, during the free sub cocktail. And he said that in their hands, now instead of raising up the temperature from minus 70 to minus 40 at five degrees per hour, they're going three degrees per hour. And this increases the contrast significantly. So this is something I will try myself and try to see how much it influences the quality. Uh, but obviously, this remark is important and I will integrate that in my work and in my forthcoming work. Another thing which is uh, annoying to all of you uh, is the fact that the resin is not that much fluid at minus 30 degrees, it's quite viscous. So that's quite annoying. Uh, and so what I did was to try to embed the stuff at zero degrees Celsius. So basically the 100%, which is the most viscous part at uh, zero degrees Celsius and it works fine and the embedding is quite good. So I'm also looking into raising the temperature more progressively along with the, with the embedding step with the resin up to reaching zero degrees Celsius with 100% uh, resin so that basically the embedding will be better, infiltration would be easier. And so the handling of the resin on its own will be as good as, uh, as, uh, as lobby krill, hoping that we will preserve the ultra structure and having a better embedding. So this is something which is also um, in, the, in, the, in the pipeline uh this is not yet completely uh fluid and i need to to work on the on the practical aspect of this but this is one thing i would recommend if you want to give it a try uh i know that at zero degrees celsius 100 percent works fine and the embedding is okay so that's uh, something to look into so to finish with this uh obviously this work was not done on my own uh you will recognize obviously the company uh which has been supporting and financing all this work uh, we have some industrial partners. We've worked a lot with Zeiss on the, on the, on the integration of uh, other technologies, the microscope you see behind me integrated with high pressure freezer. But I must emphasize the work that was done together with Lucy and Chris uh, from the Crick uh, that uh, could not have done, I mean, I, I could not expect better partners in this work. Uh, Jean-Marc Verbavatz and Rémi Le Borgne at uh, Institut Jacques Monod, who saved our lives when we wanted to launch the product. And this is something important. Uh, we have some collaboration with uh, Nico Samodaik and Anat, Anat Akiba on the correlative aspect of work. Uh, back then, I was doing this work at the Institut Curie in the, the supervision of Grassa Raposo, and together with Jean-Sain I mentioned Perrine Poggiloto for the ECCLAM software. This is something different, but this is always related, correlative microscopy. And since this September, we've been in the Kremlin Bicetre in the south of Paris, 
uh, and we are now establishing our own lab. So basically, we will be able to do uh, novel work on this resin and other applications. This is the Dropbox link that uh, Erin just mentioned uh, in, the, in the discussion channel. Uh, feel free to copy paste uh, from the discussion channel. It will be easier than just uh, repeating it from the screen. Uh, the Dropbox will be available and remain available for coming weeks. Uh, but again, there is nothing uh, that you could not find elsewhere. Uh, it's, uh, but it's, I think it's a, it's a important work that uh, led to this development. So uh, I wanted you to have a chance to look at them. And with this, if you have any questions, uh, I'm very happy to discuss them. Thanks, Xavier. That was great. Does anyone have any questions? You are welcome to unmute, to raise your hand, to, I don't know, jump up and down. Andreas has a question. I already see a paw up. Andreas, take it away. Yes, Xavier, thanks a lot. So I have a question. So you say that if you have your resin and you make a section without any contrasting agents during free substitution and then try to do post staining, you cannot get more contrast, right? So that means that uh, all the optional ionic interaction bonding signs are already taken kind of when the surface is exposed. Because, uh, you, you know, if you look at the Matsko and Müller papers, where uh, we did some experiments by just using epoxy as a fixing agent in the free substitution, no heavy metals at all. And then on this section, uh, you can, with the post staining, you get very good contrast. So this is uh, very astonishing. You have a, a clue what is going on there? No. One of the feeling I have, uh, and I would I would refer to Erin because this is something we tested uh, during during my, my PhD, um, is that basically we noticed that when you do the post staining, the stain is not going all the way down into the section, and because it's not going all the way down, you have in the end a staining of only the few top nanometers, and therefore you have a very um, you have a less efficient contrasting. That's the observation we did on tomography. Uh, it was already almost 10 years ago now. Um, but this is the same feeling that I have. I did not do tomography on these sections uh, because I considered that as a side effect. Yeah, so as far as I know, the, the post staining never really goes deep into the section. I think there are very old papers out. I think Heinz gave me once these. Uh, so they did even cross-sectioning, re-embedding and cross-sectioning of the section to see how deep the, the uh, metal or the post-staining really penetrates inside the section. Hmm. Uh, Xavier, yeah. what, what, what you experienced um, there with, with the methacrylate resins is, is similar to what I've found. That if, if, there's, if there's nothing there to start with, then no amount of kind of post-staining will, will bring out anything. Yeah, I will just say we had the, when we, when, when Xavier and I were fighting with this, it was really the UA and it was really on the thick sections for the F30. Uh, thinner sections were okay, but we got much better results if we just dropped UA completely from the post staining and just used lead. Um, so ultimately we tried to put things in the cocktail for the free so. Xavier, I, I have a bunch of other questions if no one else does, cause you know me, I always have questions. Um, you answered some of them as we went. The viscosity was great because I was curious about that. So really, you're, it's a bit of a struggle, but you're working on that, which is nice to know. Um, I wondered, because you know us, we, you and I lived in the world of tomography for so long. It, I, I wondered, so you haven't done electron tomography of this because of the section challenges, although Matt's idea of the oscillating knife is a nice one. I wondered if you've done any beam stability tests to compare thinning or responsivity in the beam or anything like this? I mean, these are mean questions because this all takes a truckload of time and you've been busy just developing it, but it would be interesting to know how it responds in the electron beam. So indeed, I have not tried that. Um, what you will notice if you do the thin sections is that basically if you expose the, the sections, uh, to a intense focus for a short while mm. it will extremely quickly thin down and it will extremely quickly become much more contrasted so basically it will 
look up very dark and very homogeneous and not so good when you look at it from low mag. You zoom in, you zoom out, and then suddenly it becomes extremely clear. So it goes along this way, but I have not quantified anything. I just observed that. Okay. Um, because the, the, I guess, beam stability, I mean, I'm not an expert in resins. You will know much more than I do, but I think, I mean, the, the nice beam, the nice resins for the volume SCM, I think some of it has to do with the beam stability, right? Or the, the consistency in fib milling and things like this. These ultimately would be important properties too, I would guess. So. All, all in the development process. Going through, switching topic a little bit, going through, I noticed you've done cells and C. elegans. Have you tried any other models? I mean, I'm thinking plants or yeast. I mean, those two were yeast. monsters to infiltrate sometimes, right? So yeast have done it uh, and it, it, it infiltrates uh, not ideally. Uh, <laughs> one of the- is evil for everything. So that's not your resin. <laughs> Uh, yeast, actually, one is one observation, but uh, it's not related to the resin, but it's uh, kind of co related to high pressure freezing is actually uh, if you have very challenging samples, uh, slightly bad freezing will improve the in uh, infiltration yeah. because you will start to crack open uh, ice needles through your membranes and then infiltration will get better. So in a way, it's kind of and that's something completely unrelated, but this is related to the machine behind me. Uh, is that we're working on uh, adjusting high pressure freezing parameters to actually, in some tricky samples, make the freezing slightly worse to improve the infiltration. That's something we have in the pipeline, but that's unrelated. But it makes sense. It's all, it all comes down. I mean, in EM, we have to admit we have artifacts everywhere. We, we'd like to think we don't, but it's controlling our artifacts, I think, is our key, right? So at least this is my opinion. Uh, okay, so I have more on the list because I always have questions. Um, you talked about 1% to 5% water. Have you tried no water? Because some people would also say that, that your water is another... I mean, I'm saying yours. I don't mean this as you personally, but addition of water to free subs is also the introduction of potentially another artifact. Um, so did you try 0% water? No, because uh, if you read the paper I mentioned uh, from 2007 uh, from uh, Walter and Buza, is that basically what they noticed is that when you open the bottle of dry ice stone, it captures the water in the, in the atmosphere and it's no longer dry. So basically, I did not go into the struggle of opening it under gas and doing all of this to make sure it's completely dry. Because I didn't do that, um, I will always have some water and therefore I decided to add in a fixed amount. Obviously this adds some variability because the humidity that will enter the, the, the acetone on a rainy day might be different. I decided not to go into that work. It was published, the results were obvious, uh, just took that uh, for granted. You just went for it. You obviously haven't done EM in Portugal because I, we look at things and it's humid here. <laughs> it's always a fight we have. If anyone else has other comments, jump in. I'm just going through my, my little thought list here that I had, so no water. Uh, this, is, this is also one that as a head of a lab worries me always. What is the toxicity and the work requirements with this resin? Because is it, is it evil? I mean, HM20, you don't wanna breathe it. You don't wanna to touch it. You don't want it anywhere near you. So what about yours? So I have a good and a bad news about that. Uh, the, the, the bad news is that exactly like HM, uh, HM20, it's a methacrylate resin. And so basically you don't want to get in touch with it. The very good news is that uh, it's an evolution. It's a, it's a different way of doing the resin and the resin is way heavier, is way longer polymers. That explains the viscosity at low temperatures because the resin being heavier and longer becomes more viscous. It interacts in a different, more sluggish way, but it also less volatile. So this is related to the various parameters, but basically if you, Considered HM20 would be uh, X long. Uh, I would say the, the our resin is uh, 20, 30 times X longer. Mm -hmm. So it's not as it's not as much of a aerosol, if I'm no. understanding correct. It's not as toxic no. in this way. Matt, you don't smell it. Yeah, you barely smell it. I was going to say, is it as stinky as the? Uh, and obviously not. It's barely as stinky. I mean, obviously, if you're just working in the AFS and you're doing all the exchanges right above, you will get it. But it's not like the HM20 where you enter the room and you smell someone is working with it. It's definitely not that bad. 
I would recommend anyway, it's a methacrylate, so I would recommend in any case to take all the, 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 the security considerations, but you don't, you won't, you won't worry as much. I, this is a horrible question and I don't know how to do this without putting some poor person to suffer, but I've heard, thankfully I don't have this, some people have methac methacrylate um, allergies after dealing with these resins and they can't even touch a polymerized block anymore. Do you know, have you, have you, have you victimized anyone to see if they can touch your resin? No one came back to me saying like, oh, look, uh, I, I, I'm going to, to, to clinical test because of you. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm knocking on wood for that. Um, but obviously it's a methacrylate resin. So, oh, I, I mean, we recommend using gloves, uh, lab coats, uh, goggles, and if you work, it's under the fume hood. I mean, all these recommendations that you would do for HM20 applies to us. It's a methacrylate resin. Methacrylate but, is, a, is a nasty product. But even when polymerized? I've not tried it. Because some people I know can't handle HM20 blocks even when polymerized because they get uh, skin allergies. So this, I guess it would be interesting to know if there's anyone in this group who has this horrible side effect, it might be interesting just to see you know, what this one's like. But thankfully, I think we've all used gloves enough that none of us have this nowadays, which is a good thing. Matt, you're unmuted again. <laughs> Chipping in again. Per personally, I use, I, I use gloves when I'm handling blocks anyway, because I don't want to get my greasy fingers on it and interfere with the, um, the sectioning. Whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I have one last question if no one else has any other thoughts. And um, this is also a naive question for me because I am far, far, far from a volume EM person, but I've seen these lovely protocols where people are doing um, different etching techniques on their resin and light microscopy so that then they can try and relocate a bit more easily in, in the sectioning or the clem techniques. Have you tried anything like this, Xavier, to see how it responds to etching? No. No? Okay. No, I, I don't have the equipment uh, here on a, on a routine base, so I did not try it. But I assume that if you have a pulsed laser, it should work the same. I mean, it's just a burning function where you heat locally the thing, so it should work. But I have not tried, and so I cannot give you any hint of how to handle this. Well, I don't blame you for having not tried, because I honestly, looking at all the evaluations you've done, I can only imagine this has been an enormous amount of work. So, so if you, what, what is your wish? I mean, if you can answer this, because I don't want to take away any company uh, secrets ongoing, but, you know, what is your wish for where you want to go or, uh, you know, is your goal at the moment to get something great for volume EM? And then from there, you, you see where the winds take you, probably. Well, that's obviously the, 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 I mean, the challenge of a, of a, of a company is uh, to make sure that uh, your company is still alive for the next coming years. So anything we do is trying to make something that uh, will suit the customers uh, and you are a large bunch of them. Um, so the idea is to produce that. Uh, I might not go into uh, a next round of improvement of the resin soon because uh, the, the amount of work is tremendous. Uh, the money that it represents is as, I mean, you scale it up. Uh, so we have a resin that works for now. If the community uh, is satisfied with that, great. If the community is asking for more, then we will need first to make sure that the community buys the first one. So it's kind of, you know, if you have more purchase, then you can develop more. Uh, and I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I, I don't handle that. I'm not the one any charge. You are a brave man, Xavier, because uh, the community will always ask for more. You should know that by now. <laughs> yes, but uh, you cannot ask if you don't, uh, if you don't support. That's true. Andreas, you have your hand up. We'll give you the last question. Yeah, thanks. I, uh, sorry, I was just uh, switching in very late. So, but uh, and I, so I have kind of a boring question, maybe too. But uh, maybe the whole community could answer anyhow. Because so so you were already addressing this regarding metacrylates and so and how dangerous they are. We all know that. I'm actually just thought about the so so I mean regular handling of these polymerized blocks and all the the, the trimming and so, all these kind of things, especially actually trimming. So what you guys are taking care of these? I mean, there's tons of, of, of debris and all that kind of things floating around. Uh, is there any, anybody who has some, some really clever solution for this? 
I don't know if it's a solution, but what we did when I designed our lab, we had um, the option of having uh, yeah. very gentle um, compressed air. So now what we do is all around the ultra microtome stations, we have essentially a little hose that's of compressed air. Of course, you don't blow it in to the microtome. This has to be really careful. You make sure you blow the, the crap or the, sorry, the debris away from the microtome. This is not a thing though for a health and safety standpoint. This is more just a clean workstation. So if your question is in the line, Andreas, of what do we do from a health and safety standpoint, I don't know. I don't have an yeah, because so so we have we have connected there's like a vacuum dryer on, on, on the trimming machine and so on. So we do all the trimming on this trimmer and try to suck off most of it. I uh, but but still I'm kind of not really uh, yeah. I mean, we are at a hospital, and I think if, if yeah, I'm not 100% convinced about how well this works or not, of course, nobody in our lab had some problems. But, but if I think about it, I mean, I have a dust bin in the vacuum filled with metacrylate debris. And is that cool? <laughs> I mean, sure. Maybe we need to put this in the, the lab waste, not in the like office yeah. waste. Or... Yeah, yeah. Michael, nice to see you, first of all. <laughs> and secondly, what, what thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, uh, j just I wanted to to uh, answer the question of Andreas. Uh, so we use uh, we use a particular vacuum cleaner, which has a filter in inbuilt. It's a it's a professional vacuum cleaner from uh, from uh, Kärcher, mm. and it's also um, um, for biosafety level two lab usable. So as you know, we have biosafety level two uh, labs and more, and we use them in our biosafety level two lab for cleaning everything there, including the debris of the trimming. And this is quite efficient and you can close the, the box without any contact. And it's, it's in a particular, uh, enclosed in a particular sack uh, and filtered. And this uh, helps a lot, and it's quite safe. So it's, an, it's not very expensive. So therefore- Oh, yeah, but it sounds good, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Cash you said, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's a Kärcher. It's a, from the professional line of Kärcher. They offer a lot of uh, and, and even larger systems if you if you like to have them. Mm. Can you share the which which type it is from from Kärcher? Yeah, yeah, I can do this. So I, I will have great. a look and and, and put it. Uh, so I, I send it to Erin and and she will <laughs> transmit it. I can disseminate <laughs> if you'd like. Yeah, disseminate is the right. Paolo, any thoughts? Uh-oh. Shit. Um we have some resin which is about uh, three years old. It's in the chemical cabinet in a dark and dry environment, sealed with uh, parafilm, and this is still working fine. Okay. So I can tell you that for three years, it's fine. I'm not sure about four or five years, but three years is fine. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Thank you. I'm back. Sorry, unstable Wi-Fi and multiple Zoom meetings happening from my house at the same time. <laughs> it's a typical strategy in this world, right? Any last thoughts? Angit, did you just want to ask for the link or was there anything else that you wanted to jump in? Um, actually, um, for uh, avoiding this dust uh, during uh, the, the trimming, sometimes I, I just wear a mask. These FFP2 masks will do. <laughs> yeah. It's nice. Yeah, Paolo is wearing one, so. Yeah, exactly. Our new worlds kind of combine, don't they? Yeah. Well, I think this was great, Xavier. Thank you very, very much for this. Um, everyone, please take note of that Dropbox link just so we don't lose it. Uh, I downloaded it and checked. I have a copy. So if you have a panic and have trouble downloading, you can always ask me and I can share again. And I, uh, I thank you all for joining us today. In two weeks, we'll have a great talk from Andreas Müller. I'm a, about their new papers. So I'm really looking forward to this as well. This I think will be superb. Thank you very much, everyone.